there's something else within this that maybe these these the things people were seeing would be you know an effect of fallout an unknown effect an atmospheric reaction to nuclear testing but another aspect of this is that it stops it just stops at some point which i believe was what 1956 or 57 exactly and that's it. somewhere there and that yeah and it no, no longer correlates tell us about that i think you already told uh, the most important bit there so i guess I guess there is not so much more to add there. So it's like, um, it, it really fits into the UFO new lore in many ways. This kind of the correlations that we see, including the stop at 1956, when there was a reporting, they, they I mean, they reported that they also stopped seeing UFOs in 1956, funnily enough. Weird so, correlations, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, but we had coincidences in these correlations. But this is, however, not the most fun thing that we got. Well, it is a super fun thing, but I would say we got one more really fun thing, like with the transients. So you have all these people always telling us, oh, you know, it's photographic plate defects and trying to convince us that this is plate defects we are seeing, plate defects that just happen to have star-like brightness profiles that look like stars. Anyway, one of the ways how one actually can test that, if it's plate defects or if it actually is what I more believe it might be, which is solar reflections. So let's say you have solar reflections and they can sometimes, if, the, if you have an object, artificial object that is very planar and highly reflective in a high orbit around the Earth, let's say at geosynchronous orbits at 42,000 and it sometimes reflects sunlight, then you will get something that looks like a transient instead of getting a streak. Because if something is inside our atmosphere and moving, let's say like a balloon is going to streak. So, but there at 42,000, you can get this transient. And what kind of test is it possible to do to say whether it's actually a plate defect or if what you're seeing is a solar reflection from an artificial object? Well, you are not going to see solar reflections in the Earth's shadow, right? The umbra. Yeah, in the umbra. If you look there you're going to see fewer transients if they're caused by solar reflections. However, if the, if the transients are caused by emissions or if they're caused by plate defects, they will be anywhere. Plate defects don't know where is the, is the shadow. What is the degree of confidence, statistical confidence, in these disappearing within uh, Earth's shadow? Well, if you take your entire sample and do a very simple test, where you just say, you can estimate how a big fraction of the sky is covered by the shadow, then you're going to get the 22 sigma result that points towards a deficit in the Earth's shadow, a deficit of transients. However, you can do your test much more carefully. So you can try to take the plates that you have and you can estimate how big. So you know the plates, you know that the, when they were, um, like these plates were exposed you know, their, the right ascension, declination of each central point, and you can just calculate, okay, so how big a fraction of these of this plates were covered by the shadow, and you can compare with the transients. And you again are going to see that there's a big deficit. And no matter how I've been trying to calculate it, I get a serious a statistically significant deficit in the shadow. If I do it the more finer way, then we are at 7.8 sigma. If I do it more the brutal way, then I get 22 sigma. But uh, there seems to be a deficit of transients in the Earth's shadow, which points towards that a fraction of them, maybe like one third of them, are caused by solar reflections. Roughly one third, I would say, from the finer ways of estimating it. Now, to expand on that, in science, six sigma is really, really solid evidence, right? And this exceeds that in any way you do it, right? It does. Now, to illustrate what, what, what this is with Earth's shadow, just imagine a solar, you know, a lunar eclipse where Earth is between the sun and the moon and blocking light. But during a lunar eclipse, it doesn't block it completely there's the penumbra and all of that business. Does that still allow visibility of the transients if you are able to look at them with a much, much higher resolution and, and magnitude ability? Say you had a, I don't know, eight meter scope or something like that, much bigger than the Schmidt camera that took the uh, Palomar plates. So could you see them still and verify them at a much lower magnitude in further research as they go into the Earth's shadow? Well, I would only stay inside the Umbra for safety. 
So I wouldn't even try to do it in any other way. And so the, in other words, they blink out like the International Space Station when it goes past the Terminator. It's, it, they just blink out. Exactly. It, it usually gets dark and you don't see it. Now, was there any other... Now, some of these correlate in a line, these transients. Yes. And almost look like, especially in the, the original paper, they, it looks like satellite tumbling, tracking. Now, is that what these are, or or is it something more along the lines that they are just simply in a kind of formation? I have no idea. You can't imagine how much I've been, like, wondering about it. It could be, like, anything. Because what if they are just hopping around, if it's some UFO hopping around, then it's going to be even more confusing. What we can say is that you get some kind of transients where 30% are, like, missing in the Earth's shadow. There is a deficit which points towards that at least like 30 or percent or one third of our sample. I, I don't remember the exact numbers now. It's somewhere in between 30% and one third of our sample are associated with solar reflections. And the rest of the sample, it could be anything, including plate defects, I would say. But you still have this interesting sample where I think it seems most reasonable that they are at high altitudes around geosynchronous orbits. Geosynchronous orbits. Yeah. In other words, they can basically hang and be a point like source. However, you were able to characterize reflectivity and things like that with these and come up with possible geometries. Tell us about that. That How reflective are these objects? Well, so that's a simulation made by Hisham in Algeria. He's a postdoc and he has been doing lovely simulations. So he has tried a certain different geometries, like possible geometries that could produce this kind of glints that we see uh, aligned in a line. And, and these are, of course, not the only shapes that can produce that. But he was like trying out what what is possible, what could possibly produce what we see, some of these examples. And it turns out they have to be highly reflective. Well, in order to get that fast flash, that causes a transient, because if you have something that is very spherical, you're going to have a streak. Or if you have something that is not highly reflective, again, you are uh, not going to have this uh, extreme, like, yeah, this extremeness of having a transient there that is bright and then you don't see anything. For that, you really need it to be super flat and super reflective and at the correct altitude. So correct me if I'm wrong on this, but to characterize that, it's like a mirror. In other words, say you have a tumbling mirror and every so often it glints in the sunlight and you see it, but most of the time you, you wouldn't be able to see it because it's tumbling. Only when it aligns and glints do you see it. Is that a good way to express this? One can see it, say it like that, yes. And it, the, the mirror could also be like attached to some larger structure, something much more complex that only sometimes this little um, surface that you can only sometimes uh, you will have the glint from the surface. And other times you will not even see the object. Or if the mirrors are moving because, you know, with the Apollo missions, they they placed mirrors on the surface of the moon that you can basically shoot a laser at and take a very accurate sounding of the distance the moon is from this. And But if that wasn't aligned, you wouldn't see it. But since it is aligned, you get a reflection. And here they just seem to be randomly aligning in order to glint in the sunlight, right? Something like that. Yeah, so that's why we have been looking for alignments. And I suspect that we have, will have to like extend these searches a little bit more because I think maybe we should also be looking at larger parts of the sky, which is much more difficult because then it's more difficult for the eye to spot this kind of transients during a visual inspection. But if you go for a larger, maybe you will even see the bending of the path. So that can be quite interesting to do. That's something I want to do. And actually, I also would like to start looking for streaks and things that might be more associated with objects at low Earth orbits. I simply want to do the maximum what we can with the photographic plates. Yeah, if geosynchronous, then that, that limits what you can do. Exactly. Because you're, you're doing something very specific. Exactly. However, you, um, you can eliminate, I think, at this point, plate defects simply by, and a lot of people are going to say, well, Kodak had problems with radioactive fallout. They were seeing it you know, appear in their emulsion, but th that would be random and it would not correlate with the Earth's umbra for sure. That's a glinting object. 
Exactly the same with cosmic ray particles. I think the, the, the umbra result is really important because it, it kind of it removes so many things and it points towards real solar reflections. Of course, there is also possibility that nature has produced some kind of objects that we just can't imagine today because we don't know that they exist. We don't we can't even imagine what it is and they might be in Earth orbit and they might be totally natural just that we We have no, no idea about them yet, but it seems simpler for me to imagine that it's something artificial just because it looks like what we see today on the sky. Part of the problem with a natural mm. explanation, though, is that when you have a meteorite or whatever, you know, a temporary satellite yeah. that Earth can capture doesn't stick around long yeah, because of the, the physics of that. Just for something like that to go into a geosynchronous orbit is asking a lot. A meteorite is just probably not going to do that, right? Exactly, neither ice crystals or any dust particles and so on. So it's it's really difficult to come up with something there. And actually, let's admit it, aliens are also natural. Oh, that's true. Uh, that's true. And I, I actually, one of the things that people often mention to me, they say, they say, well, there's no evidence of aliens. And I'm like, well, wait a minute. You are proof of concept. We are someone else's alien civilization, you know, <laughs> and and what do we do? Exactly. We crash saucers on alien worlds. Mars with the uh, rover back shells were literally flying saucers. And so I I'm, I'm careful to leave the option open, even though I'm I'm a scientific skeptic on the matter. But I don't know where you would find an alien think about things like radio signals and planets and all that but maybe that's not what they do maybe that's not what we're gonna do in in the coming centuries so I, i'll just leave i leave the options open what's your view on that well uh, somewhere far far away on some planet there is an alien wondering if we exist that's true and they would be astonished to find out that we have this conversation right now that they're being talked about they'd probably be disturbed by it They'd probably be like, the humans are talking about us. <laughs> but I think it's, I think it has to be left open, though, that this planet has screamed its biosphere for over 2 billion years, ever since the great oxygenation event. Yeah. Everybody in the Milky Way knows that this exoplanet that we live on, it has a biosphere. Because they're going to see those those weird oxygen disequilibriums and, and things like that. And eventually they'll see the Freon or whatever, the CFCs and things like that. And they're going to know. It's very hard to hide. You know, you can keep your radio signals quiet, and we generally do, but you can't keep Earth's biosphere quiet. So it would be, if, if people, you know, if, if, if the species of the, the Milky Way travel to stars, they know about this world and might be here. So you have to leave the option open because exactly. even though it's a it's quite a trek to to, you know, perform interstellar travel, physics does not prohibit it. You can if you've got enough time and maybe they have enough time. So you have to leave these options open. And I'm somehow imagining that this could be like it doesn't even have to be biological visitors i'm imagining that it could very well be like ai probes that they sent out they, let's say they have infinite amount of resources they send millions of ai probes to every interesting stellar system with an interesting planet that looks habitable and that seems to have some biosignatures they could have sent millions of them here and these little probes will be interacting and learning everything about humanity and uh, and about it. Well, maybe they were already here since the dinosaurs. And they will just learn more and more and more about us. Then they will come and interact sometimes. And maybe they, who knows? I mean, we have things like Neuralink already being built today. Maybe they have some some stuff that can interact with our brains, which means why people would be why there are so confusing experiences when people see UFOs, because there's a uh, interaction between the brain and the, and the probe. And you can have, uh, I mean, there's a lot of things you can do with just probes. Probes doesn't mean an old Voyager style thing. It could be so, so super cool thing that we can't even imagine the, the tech that it uses today.